Okay. Here we go, everyone. Please take your seats. Mine too, but I'll charter. I never did. And it's too much work. So after all those stimulating presentations, where are we? Do we have everyone? I think Stephanie may have had to leave, and Charles gave his regrets. He had to leave as well. She left for. Okay. And Dr. Soto has also had to leave. Okay. So let's uh, let's start our questions for the panel. And your mic. Okay. Let's see. Is, can we get the mic to go live? Ready for questions? Yes, we are. Um, I was hoping that they could make sure his mic was live oh. before we started, but it's the TV. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Go ahead, John. Uh, Long-term maintenance for living shorelines. That's all costs per year for nitrogen, um, and I, I, I don't know how you would figure that out beyond like five years, ten years. So the long-term maintenance is my question. What kinds of things do we need to do to maintain them once they're in place? And is it necessary to harvest the oysters at some point when they reach some sort of equilibrium with the system? Can I, can I jump in on this? Because I, I, I think that does address a comment I was using my, do I need to hold this? I, can I think you may, you may need to hold it, yeah. Oh. Um, I, I think that does address a comment that I, I wanted to make addressing the sourcing of live oysters. I, you know, the, the beauty of the living shorelines is they're self-sustaining once they get established. And uh, from experience that I personally have with another project that I've been working on, um, on, on one dock we, we put out 18 uh, mats and 36 bags and we got a settling of oysters from 30 to 70 oysters um, settling on those and and in order to in order to do that well we don't know where they came from right but but they settled and grew and and that's that that's really what what you want to go for here you want a, a, a native reproducing population that will sustain itself and grow and adjust as sea levels change as the environment's going to fluctuate um, as it will so I think that's that's one aspect we want to keep in mind. Question? Yes. John. What what seems to affect uh, the, the the future state of, of living shorelines is where we are right now. There's a lot of armoring. There has been development that we wish we would do otherwise. I'm curious what is the state of uh, zoning and code in the county and in municipalities that have shoreline. Is there anything there that says, let's not do what we did before, let's move to a, 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 a lagoon-friendly code for shoreline? Uh, I, I think we'll find that the various state-required comprehensive plans in their conservation element have lots of wonderful words, but those wonderful words have to be converted into uh, zoning rules, land development code, and actions by PNZ boards and so on. Can somebody tell me what the status is? And if the status isn't, boy, it's really wonderful, uh, where does that fit into the Living Shoreline Project? That is a great question and something that uh, a lot of the partners in the area want to make sure that if we you know, produce these shoreline restoration models that they have teeth and that there's um, support from the city and county level to really make them happen, um, whether that's codifying them, putting them into ordinance um, or another option. So the city of South Daytona and the city of Port Orange have shoreline uh, management ordinances that require certain um, levels of living shoreline depending on what your shoreline is. And once that is in place on a property, it can't be undone to create hardened shoreline. Um, so that was put into place in Port Orange, I know, about 2009. Uh, but part of what we're trying to do with the shoreline characterization work uh, that Brevard County and, 
UCF and a number of other partners are sort of piecing together through the region is provide that tool to the counties uh, and cities to say, hey, look, we've, we've mapped your shoreline. Now you know what you have. And, you know, we're going to help you with prioritizing those areas that, that um, you know, require some stabilization. Um, but we need your help in really moving this forward from there. If, if you were, to, if there were to be produced a model code, I, I think we could all fall in on it. Uh, Courtney, you, do you have anything done on Satellite Beach? Nope. On shoreline, do you have code in, on shoreline? Um, we we don't have a code on on requiring okay. living shoreline. We just have codes on when you can harden it. So we we have okay. specific codes that disallow that um, unless it's certain situations. I, I, I think a model code would be useful. And one of the things I wanted to comment on, we're, we are headed in general in the right direction in the fact that Army Corps is starting to streamline the process so it's less of a disincentive for homeowners to do living shorelines um, before the permitting process for seawalls was that easy and that cheap and then to do something that actually has bigger benefits for the wider system was more difficult and expensive which <coughs> makes no sense as you mentioned when um, all the regulators are talking about, you know, oh, you should do this, you should do that, and then the actual regulations don't support it. Um, so we're headed in the right direction, and the beauty of living shorelines is that people that do have an existing structure will have the ability to modify it so that we're not just keeping every seawall that is currently in existence there as it stands until it fails. So, so there are ways to make the treatments to, to put it closer to the living shoreline side. Courtney? Um, I just wanted to comment. Um, that that we also have the perception among the public that armoring is better it, easily. I mean, it, it, I can't tell you how many people they, they feel that an engineered wall will do better protecting their home than a living shoreline, and that is absolutely, you know, probably our biggest challenge in getting people to put the shoreline in is that is overcoming that idea. So I think you know part of our job is we really need to to go with the education piece and, and promote that locally, and cities should be working on that as well, um, because it's not just the codes, it's, you know, people argue with you when you're permitting. So, um, so I just want to make that comment that it's, it is our job on the local level to not only adopt those codes, but also provide that education piece to our public to say that living shorelines are better. Yeah, so that, that's an all hands on deck kind of situation where it's great to have a citizen oversight committee that supports living shorelines, agency partners, academia supporting it with research, nonprofits to do education and outreach for this. Everybody's got to be on the same page or else it's an uphill battle the whole time. Um, so, again, we're, we're moving in the right direction, I think. So just to give you some reference for what we talked about with the city of Titusville, when we presented them with uh, the plan, their goal, since they don't actually have it, you know, written into a code or anything required now, is to actually start using it as people come forward. With Hurricane Matthew, there was a lot of seawalls and riprap that were damaged, so a lot of people are in the process of repairing them. And so they're kind of using this plan to help encourage them to look at alternatives. So it's not required yet, but at least it's like starting to get the conversation going in the community and getting more people people kind of aware of uh, those options instead of just going right back to putting another seawall in. Okay. Can we open it up to the, uh, to the audience here? If you could step up to the mic, make sure that your mic is on the question. Let's start with Mel. Uh, Melissa Martin. Hi, Melissa Martin. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, have there been any efforts to um, reach out to insurance companies, home insurance companies, to determine this analysis of that na uh, natural shorelines are safer for your homes? Um, I was actually at a conference a couple months ago, and they were discussing this idea. And on the insurance side, um, the way I understood it, it was still challenging because they haven't been in place long enough to kind of create enough data to make the insurance companies comfortable with it. So on the insurance side, they're kind of, as the homeowners are, they're still a little mm -hmm. skeptical that it's going yeah. to be uh, functional. So on their side, I think they're waiting for a little bit more data. Um, I can say for after Hurricane Matthew, all of my living shoreline sites did great, and all my 
rep sites are highly damaged. So <laughs> the, the, da the uh, data is coming soon, hopefully, but I think we're still at the early stages of that part. Okay, please come forward. Uh, my name is Dr. Randy Parkinson. I'm a coastal geologist. I've lived in Melbourne for 30 years. I have three observations that perhaps the committee or that can count on here. One of them is with regards to private property. So I went out and looked at alternative methods that could be used if you didn't have access to an NGO, the free stuff, material and labor, but you wanted a living shoreline. <clears throat> and I looked at Coquina. And uh, I costed it out at two different, uh, I had private property owners that were interested, two different configurations. It turned out that the cost for the Coquina to be delivered and placed on the site was 50 to 85 percent of the reimbursement potential at $95 a foot. This didn't include plants, it didn't include planting, it didn't uh, include uh, post-construction restoration because there's heavy equipment. So I think there's a heavy lift here and this gets to uh, the second point, the first being private property owners and how they engage without just going to a consultant and having everything bought but also to a point that was raised in terms of the production capacity of oyster bags and volunteers, which is what we have right now. You know, I calculate it's two miles of shoreline, it's 40,000 oyster bags at the minimal configuration. It's 10,000 plants. So that's a half a million oyster bags over 10 years and 100,000 plants. Do we even have the potential to produce this, which is why I looked at an alternative design. And thirdly, I am concerned uh, that if we look at restoration success and we measure that on the ability of these oysters, which are essentially breakwaters, to recruit and sustain and rejuvenate oysters, I think uh, that that would, I would really caution. You know, I have never encountered relic oysters in the lagoon. I've sampled and cored. Yes, there are areas, but oysters require a tidal range. They require water to flow through them, not only to provide food, but to get rid of fecal material. We don't have a tidal range here. And when we look at restoration success, I think we should be very careful about expecting these oysters, who may recruit initially, but that they would actually produce a living bioherm that goes beyond and expands beyond, I think is questionable. We just don't know. And we certainly can look at where they are today and where we're putting them, which gets to the idea of site selection. But I think in terms of evaluating restoration success, it's very important perhaps to emphasize the vegetative element of this and be careful about front-loading with oyster bioherms. And I would really appreciate the committee's insight on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, a good point. Um, there's a lot of uh, creatures living out in the water as a, uh, you know, I got my training in coastal engineering and I've been introduced to a lot of biology now. I work very closely with biological oceanographers and um, the names I can't even, even pronounce and, and these creatures look alien to me but there's a lot more out there than just the oysters. We have the barnacles, we have the mussels, we have the tunicates, the bryozoans a whole slew of sponges and and all of these creatures will settle before before the oysters do and uh, and, and a healthy a healthy reef is not just the oysters and, and all of these creatures are filtering they're all uh, performing an ecosystem service the tunicates are filtering smaller particles um, than, than oysters can so they're getting at the viral uh, kind of bacterial viral sized particles uh, a very, 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 some of the smallest uh, algaes. Um, so it, 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 it is not just the oysters. I think the reason, um, you know, th there's a few reasons that, that, that oysters are, are, uh, are being focused on because the, the, they have the substrate and there's, there's a lot of background research in, into, into their, their benefits, both for the nutrients and the filtration. Uh, but it is a whole ecosystem that you're building when you put those reefs out there. And, and so I think you know, you know, we need to keep that in mind as well. Just to respond to that, I appreciate Please it. come up to the mic. You know, I can appreciate the importance of biodiversity in these areas, um, but those organisms don't, they, they don't produce first significant vertical relief or expand. They're a small portion of the volume of the reef. And if we are using these 
I get the water quality and all that, and the importance of these uh, secondary organisms, but with regards to the purpose of these bags, it is to reduce wave energy and to expand primarily. Secondarily, it is to filter feed and, and so forth like that. If we don't put, so I get it. I just, again, I think uh, that uh, the oysters are what are going to drive the long-term viability of expansion, substrate, recruitment, and increased biodiversity. In the end, it's a good idea. I just think we need to be careful in terms of what we can expect down the road. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Parkinson. I, I agree with your points that, you know, we have been doing a lot of work on oysters. Um, and we've learned a lot, and we've also been learning a lot about seagrass restoration over the past few years since we've had major losses. And although we haven't identified how to really do that on a large scale, um, we're still learning, and in the meantime, you know, we're doing what we can on shorelines and oysters. But certainly, the lagoon is a seagrass-based system, and we don't want to be piling up oyster reefs on areas that were historically seagrass. Um, you know, we want to maintain um, all of the different components of the system as best we can. So. Uh, and I, I believe Brevard Zoo is looking more and more into clam restoration and um, some, some other options to really make sure we're covering the system. Um, the other point I wanted to make was um, what came up earlier, and I'm glad we've gotten back to this, about our, our capacity to do this level of restoration. Um, we have a lot of great work happening, but is it enough to cover this much shoreline and, and do this amount of work? There's been a lot of discussion among these uh, working groups that I mentioned earlier about how can we make sure that we have the materials, we have the manpower, um, and we have those techniques fine-tuned uh, to make this happen. And the Marine Enhancement Center that I mentioned earlier up in Volusia County, we have 12 Marine Enhancement Center sites around the state. And typically, the purpose is um, fishery stock enhancement. But we're realizing in certain areas that may not be the need. Um, the need may be shellfish stock enhancement or um, seagrass stock enhancement. So, you know, there, there are discussions ongoing that um, there's not a fish hatchery on that site right now. That was part of the plan, but now we're starting to talk more about, you know, that, that may not be the need and, and, you know, we may need to um, really think more about having a shellfish hatchery there um, to help provide seed for, for some of these projects. Can I, can I ask her? Yes, to... please, John. <clears throat> One of y'all, I actually want to come back to clams because they were here before. Yeah. So I'd love to see you guys do that. One of y'all mentioned that north of, I guess, Titusville, we can't use their oysters. So an oyster hatchery in Daytona, somebody says we can't do. Do you know who says we can't do this? So it's really native stock, but if you have a hatchery, you can grow what you need. So if we know that there's a need for stock in certain regions, you can grow that in the hatchery to send to that region. Um, we have similar guidelines about like East Coast versus West Coast marsh grasses. Um, and again, it goes back to what was mentioned earlier with disease resistance and just adaptations to particular conditions. Um, okay. Don't look satisfied with that. No, I'm not. <laughs> Especially in regards to oysters, I'm not. But yeah. go ahead. So I guess the, the simplified version is if there were to become a, a hatchery in Daytona or somewhere, they could grow Brevard County stock for our uses. Right. So that that would so allow that's us to... Potentially that's our backup plan for the one place that's growing for us. But there are Correct. other hatcheries in Florida right now that we could contract with. And they're selling them for 20 to $45 per thousand, not... $12,000 for one small group that we got in October. Well, and the discussion is, you know, not just this Volusia County facility, but how can we make sure we have these restoration enhancement centers all the way up and down the lagoon? So, you know, from potentially Florida Oceanographic Society and Stewart, um, you know, all the way up through um, Volusia County and, and potentially beyond. So how can we have them strategically placed with different components, whether it's mangroves at MRC, um, sea grasses, oysters, and have that stock available um, in different locations. So not, not just the one. So I 
just I had a, an example for you and for the uh, the genetic stuff with the oysters. Um, part of uh, our work that we've done in the past has actually been going to Apalachicola Bay, which is well known for oysters up there. Um, there, they actually say that as soon as the salinity goes over 25 parts per thousand, all the oysters in the lagoon die. Now in Mosquito Lagoon, we almost never get below 25 parts per thousand, and we have lots and lots of oysters. So what you end up with in a lot of these areas is very specific local adaptation. So one of the fears of bringing Apalachicola oysters here is that they simply wouldn't be able to tolerate the conditions. So on that side, it's like ensuring survival by making sure that what you bring in is has a good chance of, of surviving, if that mm -hmm. helps clarify for you. It, it does, and that certainly impacts the taste. For example, the same spat in two different parts of a river will come out as different. Yeah. Okay. So if you brought Apalachicola spat down here, spat, and mm -hmm. put it in the Indian River, you're telling me that it would not last at the 25 or more? I mean, there's a really good chance, yeah, that it would never actually develop beyond the spat stage. Huh. Really? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Not, not always. There's always variation, but a good chance. Okay. George? I'm George Rosenfield. I'm a longtime resident of Brevard County. Uh, archaeologically, the Indian River Lagoon uh, base used to be paved with oysters, as evidenced by all the oyster middens that we see from the age along the shorelines. We're discovering more and more all the time from the ancient people that used to live here. Uh, about, but it doesn't exist anymore. About 20 years ago, plus or minus a few years, the county commission had a, a, had a meeting uh, rented out either oyster beds or clam beds for about a dollar a year per, per group, whatever they say, 100 feet square or something, to commercially harvest either oysters or, or, or uh, clams. And 30 to 20 years ago, I used to harvest clams over off the, uh, off the eastern shore, on the, west, on the western shore of the Barrier Islands down in South Melbourne. And I, I, Personally, I don't like oysters. <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what about the uh, fu future? Uh, when can people start, the residents start eating oysters or harvesting oysters, and when can we ha start having, uh, allowing commercial uh, ha uh, uh, harvesting of oysters so that maybe the county can get a bounty from the commercial people and get some of the money back that we're investing on them? I don't want people going now and, and taking oyster, fresh oysters off the oyster reefs that mm -hmm. we're putting on there now. But when, when uh, can, in the future, can, can we look forward to commercial harvesting and residential harvesting of oysters and clams? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, so that is the long-term goal, right? To not only restore our water quality so that the lagoon is healthy and back on its feet, but to get enough of our native oysters back in place that people can enjoy them for consumption if that is their preference. I'm with you. I, I don't think they're particularly great, but um, they're fun to play with and work with out in the lagoon. Um, so uh, any of the reefs that are restored as of right now with permits people aren't legally allowed to harvest from is the understanding that I'm under. So any of the investment that we do to build a particular reef, that physical location will not be harvestable. But the great thing is oysters breed and replicate and their little baby oysters float around in the water column until they find a suitable substrate to land on and start growing. So they will move from that reef over time, the babies. Um, and as you were talking about clams, um, the zoo actually uh, had an initial proposal um, for funding uh, to do a pilot project on clams as well. Um, that got cut, I believe, by uh, uh, the governor. Um, so we just focused on the Living Shoreline demonstration uh, site for that. Um, but that is something we'll look at in the future. The problem is um, oysters only move when they're babies uh, in the water column. Clams continue to move. Um, so they don't stay in a discrete location for us, which makes things a little more difficult. Um, but we are looking into it. Um, right now, FWC has partnered up with um, the Aquatic Preserves and, and FIT to um, look at the health of actual 
oysters on an organismal level, because often we think of oysters as a resource in regards to habitat. But most people who don't do this for a living think of oysters as a resource for food. Um, but when we're monitoring the health of oysters, we usually look on a reef scale. So uh, this year, we've been looking at an organismal scale on restored reefs versus natural reefs. You know, what's the prevalence of disease? Um, what's their muscle tissue actually made up of? Are they healthy? Are they, you know, filtering like we think they are um, in different regions of the lagoon to find out if there is, in fact, you know, a big difference from the northern parts of the lagoon, central and southern? And then, um, you know, is there more resilience or resistance in restored reefs versus natural? So. Um, those, those results should be coming out within the next year. That project's finishing up this summer. Um, but, but yes, that's certainly something that we, we want to know the answer to as well. Okay. Okay, we have, uh, go ahead, Danielle. If a homeowner wants to put a natural shoreline outside of their home, they could go to the website, naturalshorelines.com, and what kind of process would they face? Mm -hmm. A very good question. Uh, and a lot of it depends on what already exists and what they want to do uh, to their shoreline and what potentially the ordinances and, and regulations are in their area. So um, if it's something as simple as they have a gently sloping eroding bank and all they need to do is kind of regrade it and add some native plants fairly minimal process because you're working on your own property so you're not in that sovereign submerged land below the average high water line um, so it's your land you can kind of do what you need on that if you're going through a more extensive process where you have to um, you know you've got a hardened structure or you want some oysters or some coquina down at the bottom um, you know, I w your first stop is going to be talking to your permitting folks in your area. So that, that would be the Department of Environmental Protection first uh, and using those regional contacts to help walk you through what kind of permits are you going to need and what's that process going to look like. And so do you guys guide them to the right departments for their location? Yes. So that's okay. part of the website is uh, you can pull up a map of Florida and you click on, you know, your county. And okay. it gives you um, examples in your area, it gives you a plant list for your region, and it gives you regional contacts. Everything from permitting people to um, state and federal agency folks to the nonprofits who might be able to come out and help you with a site visit and actually kind of talk you through your options. Um, and, and are there and contractors those. also that do this that's, that are listed? That's something that we've talked about a lot. Um, I think there's a gap in the market there. And uh, <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot of agreement out there. Okay. Um, yeah. So okay. we, from a real estate perspective, I think that that will be a common question. Well, who can I hire? Right. And some of our nonprofit partners right now are working on putting together workshops for contractors that could be, that could count for some of their continuing education units and their um, professional credits that educates them on living shorelines, how to make them happen, where to get the resources, and, and that sort of thing. So those are in the works. We know that's a gap in the market. But any suggestions from um, you know, different sectors on how to make that appealing and effective uh, for these contractors, we're very open to that discussion. OK, Courtney, and then we're going to go to open questions from the I audience. I would just make the comment that that permitting piece Nothing scares to death a homeowner more than have to contacting three different state agencies to yep. do something. Yep. And and we deal with it like, you know, on a it scares me and I'm a city and I do it every day. So it that would be if we could all work together, you know, a big deal if we could get one stop permitting and decide you know, figure out what agency would do that piece. Um, it, or maybe have the, the local governments be the, you know, the feeder to that because um, that that is the impediment impediment it, 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 it hands down and I think that's why you don't see contractors going into that field either because they don't want to do that it's much easier to you know put St. Augustine grass in because there's no permit required to that I, I mean honestly so we you know, we make it easy to do the wrong thing mm -hmm. but we make it really you know really hard to do the right thing so and, and just to follow up on that and and, yeah. and even when you do get the permits process going it can take months yes. and so you know, people have a very 
short attention span and they want things done when they want them done. And if you tell them, well, it might be up to six months before we can tell you whether or not we can do it, you know, the contractors aren't going to want to do that right. and the homeowners are again going to find a, a less suitable option. I mean, I, I would recommend, you know, because state agencies are so strapped and I know that, you know, we, we all know that because we have to permit three years. <laughs> um, so, you know, it would, it would be great if you gave the parameters to the local governments to permit and gave us that authority because we, you know, that it would be done. I mean, so that would be my advice to, to look into. Um, and I know that's hard to, to do, um, but it would, it would make it feasible. I, th I think anything that would streamline that situation would incentivize homeowners to jump on it. Just, just a follow-up comment on that as well. If counties and cities were to pass an ordinance that guarantees a certain amount of business for private contractors that would be interested in branching out into this. So that's some way to kind of guarantee them their investment in education, in learning the permitting process for living shorelines, would be followed up with financial gain as homeowners now approach them to do this. Hmm. And we have two projects in the works right now, one in Volusia County and one in St. Lucie County, where a group of homeowners has approached um, um, our agency or some of our partners and said, exactly what you guys are saying, which is we want to do this, but it's terrifying. So we're really, with those projects, we're trying to get one permit for the neighborhood um, and help them through that process, uh, you know, with agreement that, okay, now we can do this on a larger scale, but if all the property owners are in agreement that they want this to happen, we can hopefully um, kind of link that together in one permit. Is this, is this a okay. state permit or a federal permit or a combination that you're working on? Uh, both. So it starts with Department of Environmental Protection, and then they forward that through Army Corps of Engineers. So in that case, they've already streamlined it. You submit to one agency, and then they automatically send it to the next one. So you don't have to send it twice. Um, but it does have to go through both state and federal agencies. Um, to, to put plants in. Yeah, but yeah, to put plants. I got that. Yeah. Anything that involves the Army Corps of Engineers, they have a calendar that only has years on it. Okay, that's the big holdup. And in some way, the state could get a, a universal license to go ahead from the Corps of Engineers to manage this tiny little bit of what those guys do for a living. Uh, it, it, it would help a great deal. Because the least important thing to, to Colonel Ruru, who runs the district in Jacksonville, is whether this homeowner gets his 100 foot of shoreline oysters yeah. on it. And, and that's, I, I, I think that's really the long pole in the tent, and everything else can be managed by folks in this room. So we take this uh, comment. Okay. I was just going to quickly, which is exactly what that nationwide permit is for that yep. I mentioned earlier. The nationwide 54 is the Army Corps saying, we recognize that these small, you know, these smaller projects for homeowners with these certain techniques are a benefit. So we're going to make those a much more streamlined process. So, yeah. um, but it's fairly new, and, and we we'll see kind of how it how it works. But we're excited to have it. Okay, let's take a couple more comments. We do want some time to open it up to general comments from the audience. Go ahead. Can, can I just make a comment really quick sure. about the Nationwide 54? I just want to, for a little perspective, um, we just received um, permits for the Living Shoreline demonstration site. It took us, uh, I think it was less, it's less than three months we got the Army Corps uh, permit at turnaround, which, you know. Good stuff. And, yeah. yeah, and that was a, a new design, <laughs> and That's but like the true. Nationwide 54 <laughs> was, a, was a lot streamlined. Mm -hmm. yes. Andy Parkinson. Uh, a comment on the contracting. You know, I wear an academic and I'm also an environmental consultant. And if uh, consultants thought that there was money in this, they'd all be here today. And they're not. Because there's no money in living shorelines uh, for them to be made here. I mean, like I mentioned, you know, at $97 or $95 a foot, when half or three quarters of that goes to materials and, and equipment, and you still haven't gotten the permits, and you still haven't bought the plants or put anything in before construction, there's no way anybody is going to try to make a living expanding into this area. And if they did, I would highly recommend that you develop workshops and a certification because uh, unless somebody's going to tell you 
uh, you know, the bathymetry, the topography, the species, the salinity, you know, you just, a person can't just go out there and do that and be successful. So I do think that, um, uh, you know, the NGOs and, and the universities do have experts, which we all rely on. You know, I've got 35 years, you know, I know what I'm doing, and I'm here. <laughs> but really nobody else is because there's no money or they don't have the expertise. Mm -hmm. So I think we should really think long and hard about the potential for private property owners to walk, to get online and to figure out how to do this. They're going to want to hire a consultant. Or the other way, as was mentioned earlier, is the scaling issue. As you get more and more property owners, the cost, say, for a consultant go down. But then now you're requiring homeowners for hundreds and hundreds of feet, and that's rare. Mm -hmm. So I think we can, you know, the idea that private property owners are going to hire consultants and build their shorelines is probably low. The best bang for the buck for the county is going to be public lands and free stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, Danielle, and then we're going to move to the... Uh... Well, I, I wanted to oh, comment back to that. If people don't see the value in it because of the cost associated, they can see the value in it in the saving of their property. Um, I saw an equation of mangroves to storm shutters for your house. They're the superior product. And so if people see the science and the difference between the two, that will create value. This is a perfect thing. So the two <laughs> pe the people that I found that were interested in this were people that saw the value. And they were willing to pay out of their own pocket to complement. So, but that's not very many people. So this idea of communication, which we've been doing for 30 years here, but we still struggle with these perceptions. But you are right. There are people that understand that the erosion, the property value, the contribution to diversity, and so forth. And they, you know, in both cases, in mine where I didn't, where I couldn't budget at $95, uh, you know, several of them were willing to spend money beyond mm -hmm. that. So that is a great point. Mm -hmm. So public education is a real key here. Okay. We'd like Courtney. Because I, I, I can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should work very hard to not require a three month long permit process for people doing the right thing. Right. Mm -hmm. It it that should not happen. And. It, you know, so it, it should be a three-month-long permit process for people who want to do the wrong thing. <laughs> so, so if we really want to encourage this, the certification program, I think, for, you know, contractors and even certification program for local governments that can permit on behalf of the state agencies, you know, to do it fast. And, I mean, they should, the homeowners, three months to a homeowner is like, Really? You know, to, to us as a city, I mean, that's normal, but to them it's not. And, you know, so that is a huge impediment. And to them it's a cost, and they're not going to do it. So if we really want to encourage this, we have to get better at that. Yeah. It's not here. Okay. How long did it take to get the permits for muck dredging for the county? I mean, you had hair when you started. <laughs> did, did the problem, the problem is that the state and federal level and in Jacksonville and with with the core and right. we've all experienced it and you're exactly right if I'm a home I'm a homeowner if I want to do the right thing it should be easy mm -hmm. okay if I want to do the wrong thing it should be made challenging right. mm -hmm. it, it, it strikes me that there may be a role for the trust fund here and I pass this on to Virginia at least for thinking about but we've said we need two sets of model documents. One is model code, and the second is a model permitting process. If that's what's going to enable the most efficient and most effective spending of the money we got for Living Shoreline, then that's a critical step. That's a first critical step. It's, uh, it's not sufficient, but it sounds to me like it's necessary and, and, uh, uh, and probably catalytic in making this move forward. There's a lot of leverage there. So, Virginia, a question to you from a member of the Oversight Committee. Is there any way that we can legitimately either spend trust fund money to move towards model codes in the area of permitting and, and zoning? Uh, uh, and could you uh, consider possibly no motion 
consider possibly coming forward with language that would be a useful change to the lagoon plan to make that happen. I think there's a big bang for the buck here, and, and I also think it's going to be darn hard to spend the money we have right now for living shoreline if we have to keep going through these institutional and governmental minefields to do the right thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, we There's have. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We have 68,000 acres of mosquito impoundment that is edged by berm that is eroding. Four miles of that berm was breached during Hurricane Matthew. So we have loads of public opportunity. You know, in addition to all the state, federal, county, city shoreline, we have loads of opportunity to get started with all of that shoreline. Um, and private citizens can also you know, partner with the zoo and come to us as substitute projects, you know, or partner with in any of these NGOs and come to us with substitute projects and we can walk those properties through this process and help that happen. And so I think, you know, like what Annie and, and Jane were describing, the permitting process was horrendous this living shoreline thing is a fairly recent push. The state rules changed and created an exemption process just a few years ago. Just a few months ago, there's a new nationwide process. So the agencies are, they're getting on board and it's, it's a, you know, it's a slow process. So let us work through these things and that will help us find that that pathway, but I think if we just start hammering on the agencies up front, we won't, without examples, without proof of concept, without proof in the pudding, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, 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 I would respond that although I believe in evolution, I don't think that government processes are an example of that. And, and I would suggest that, that if permitting and model code are barriers to the success of the Living Shoreline Project, that, that, that we ought to attack them. If you've got a fire, put out the fire. If you've got flooding, stop the flooding. If you've got a problem with permitting and code that are encouraging mm -hmm. people in the wrong direction and discouraging them in the right direction, we ought to attack that. And we're not talking about rocket science. We're talking about somebody with a word processor and a bit of brains putting together a model and it goes from there. Mm -hmm. John, the John briefly. I, I'm going to I'm going to say that that's A, out of our scope, and B, we're only talking $10 million out of $320 million. Let's focus on what we can do and not try to fight another battle. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to need a motion to extend the meeting 15 minutes just so we can complete our agenda and open it up to public comment. John, are you making the motion? I, I would, but I'm, alternate, I'm an alternate, so I can't do that. Tonight. I move for John. 15 okay. Okay. In a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, we're open for public comment, and on what we've been discussing or other topics. Seeing no hands. Uh, can, uh, yes. I would just like to follow up with the permitting issue because I think. <laughs> Because I do think it is so important, and, and though it, I'm not sure whether or not it's, it is within the scope of this committee, I do think it's important for us to stay on top of those regulating agencies and let them know that, uh, that, that this is an issue that, that we're having here. And I don't know how that fits in, but I, I, as, a, as a citizen that lives in here on yeah. the Barrier Island, I would 100 percent support. Uh, some effort going to letting the regulating agencies know that the permitting process is backwards. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I would just like to second that because I, I, I think we've got, we do have a mission here and we've got projects and we're certainly a project oriented committee, but right now this is 10 years. That's not going to save the lagoon, right? It's a great start. And so we've got to do things that really engage the mass of the pop that, that look beyond that time. And I think getting to the point where we've got you know, everybody that lives along the lagoon with some ability to be active participants in this helps move to that next mm -hmm. level. And if that means taking some minor portion of this money that we have to be able to look past that 10-year mark when we don't know what, 
whether we've got money or not, and we don't know how much we've done, that I think is a great step forward to making this into a sustainable issue over time, uh, mm -hmm. initiative over time. Okay, Danielle, and then Melissa. I'll make it quick. I see empowering homeowners as yep. part of the solution past 10 years. Mm -hmm. By making homeowners feel like this is easy to lend a hand, mm -hmm. to change their yard, to, in any kind of way, empowering the homeowners is the future for the lagoon. I, no, I, I don't want to disagree with that at all. We've had lengthy discussions with the zoo about as we design each of these first projects, we are going to, we are going to be filling out those permit applications. We will end up with templates for what every single one of those permit applications is going to look like, and then we can provide that to anybody who's interested. And all they have to do is, you know, scrub out the previous signature and put theirs in and change the address. So our goal is to make this, you know, as, as simple as possible. But it's going to be, a, we don't have everything we need to make it simple right now. Okay, Courtney. We, we need a Sorry. snap process Courtney. for this. For this. I, I was just going to comment, you know, um, I don't know if it really this, it is the scope of this committee, but I think it is the scope of the local governments to work with the state agencies to streamline the permit process. And, and you know, that, that could be something that we could, um, you know, sit down in the, you know, the associations that we work together in and try to, to work with Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. and Army Corps and, and St. John's to do, because I think it is important. Um, so I, I will be glad to go back and see how we can do that and bring that back to the committee um, as, you know, kind of like a thing that I, I'm, I'm interested in and, and make, you know, maybe come back to you and tell you what I think we need to do if, if this committee needs to do anything, you know, and, and go that direction if that's okay. Stephanie. Speaking to, to John's comment about SNAP, the EDC, the Economic Development Commission of Florida Space Coast was the one that initiated and started that program. And they reached out because they were finding that uh, developers were having so much trouble when they would come into a region. They wanted to, you know, put a McDonald's in West Melbourne and they had different permitting and, and different uh, code enforcement. And then they wanted to put one in Satellite Beach and it was completely different. And so they came in and said, we need to have, you know, a, a concerted effort to streamline the process and to make everything pretty consistent throughout the county. And that worked very effectively. And I think if we go back to, and just as Courtney said, I don't have a problem going, I sit on the board for the EDC and bringing this issue up and saying, would you consider doing the same thing for uh, the local um, municipalities bringing this to them that this is an issue and can we make a consistent program and streamline the process for living shorelines it, that's a great idea because the in the EDC has taken the lagoon very seriously mm -hmm. I mean they're sure. they're very huge supporters of, of the efforts I mean I mean they've spent you know when they've spent an enormous amount of lobbying effort to to get the, the funds to the lagoon so I think mm -hmm. they would be they would probably be very interested. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I uh, add to the, the permit discussion? I do think, like as we talked about with the homeowners being nervous and the contractors being nervous, I think the permitting people are nervous too about the living shorelines. I mean, I think that that is part of the problem. And the first uh, one, the first time I ever went out to do a living shoreline project, the lady rejected my permit because she said red mangroves weren't native to Volusia County. I had to take her out and show her red mangroves in Volusia County before she'd approve it. And I, I like just as much as a year ago, I took a permitter out from St. John's that asked me to take her by one of my old sites because she'd never seen what one looked like in person. So I think part of this resistance and, and you know, kind of a slowness that we're seeing does come from the fact that they're not quite sure how to permit this right. stuff yet or what's a good idea, so what's a bad idea. <laughs> so I think the more we do it, the more we can show them what's, a, what's good, what's bad. I think I'm optimistic that it will get easier in the future because the more they see that it is working, I think the less resistant they will be to, to seeing it used in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh. Melissa Martin. <laughs> Good. I don't know what time it is. We've got ten minutes. Good morning, I think. Good morning. Uh, Melissa Good. Martin, um, on behalf of the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition, I uh, just wanted to explain who we are, what we, why we exist. We exist to fill gaps. 
to help the community um, in whatever aspect needs to happen, especially on the public engagement side of things and government engagement to, um, to fill in whatever needs to happen uh, sooner the better for Lagoon Restoration. So I, uh, I actually started to sit back down because it sounded like everyone was starting to engage on this permitting issue. And if there wasn't, you know, various people in your beautifully diversified uh, trades going back to your respective industries and, and committees and uh, leagues and things like that, then we would have come forward and say, we can handle that and, and go forth in our network of connections and things like that. But it's beautiful. And so we're here to serve you. We're here to serve the community, the agencies, the, the nonprofits. Um, and we're just um, delighted that everyone's here and, and already doing it, so it makes our job easier. So that being said, um, it's just a standing offer. If and whenever you need uh, assistance in public engagement, in, um, in packing a room when there's an important public hearing on, on certain matters, et cetera, so that's what, we, that's what we're here for. Um, and an ex another example is that I, um, right after this, I'm going to a different event where we are, uh, I get to speak on lagoon issues for a, a particular sect of, of our population that normally probably wouldn't be engaged in conservation hearings or anything like that. Um, and it's a golf tournament focused on HOAs that are wa you know, waterfront properties. So these guys, I'm, I'm hoping to transpose all of this information. I love that there's a website that can walk people through, so that's, that's a huge thing. But it's, that's what it's all about. It's connecting information and sharing information with people that probably don't have it yet. Um, so that's what we're there for. We're still working on our website to really house, um, uh, provide a clearinghouse for this type of information, unless and until the NEP has their own big <laughs> one ring to roll them all type of website. So like I said, we're just here to fill in the, fill in the gaps of what needs to happen. But um, if you have any questions for me right now or later, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And, 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 and yes. I'd, just, I'd just like to follow up on the living, uh, living shoreline and, and something that, um, that Dr. Donnelly was saying. Uh, I think the permitters and the agencies uh, that, are, that are in charge of that will get a lot more comfortable when the rest of the engineering community starts to get more on board. And what we've seen, um, the uh, ASBPA, the Shore and Beach Preservation Association, uh, a lot of my colleagues in the engineering field, are, um, we put together a special, uh, a special edition of their, of their journal, Shore and Beach. It's going to be focused on living shorelines. So I, I think a lot of the folks uh, in, in, in the coming year, we're going to see a lot more information of, of very rigorous studies done, like, like the one that we've been doing at, at Florida Tech will be published in that. Um, and, uh, colleagues uh, from, from Stevens Institute and University of South Alabama, uh, all over. And so I think once this information starts coming out, then, then we'll, uh, you know, we will have that information we can send back to, uh, to the agencies, as well as okay. all the great work that's going on at UCF and, and, and elsewhere. Okay. Great. Seeing no other questions, let's move to final comments uh, by committee members. And first of all, I understand Christina has an announcement. Um, I am actually, I took a job in Orange County, so I will be leaving. Um, I love this project. I've loved everything about working with the Indian River Lagoon. I feel that part of working for local government is making sure that you leave an imprint on the community, a positive one, and make it better than where you started. And I was privileged to be a part of the NEP's move from the management district over to the council um, back in 2014, and privileged to also be part of the formation of this council and to work with Virginia um, in the referendum. And um, we will have a new attorney. Her name is Christine Vol Valor Valier. Um, she's right back here. She is the um, she is the attorney for natural resources, so she does have a breadth of knowledge of the natural resources ma uh, matters, um, much more than I do. So she'll she'll be very helpful um, to this board. Um, I am a little jealous of her because she's going to get to see where this goes from here, but um, I am also excited for the new opportunities that arise, and I just wanted to thank you guys for all your hard work and to say goodbye. Thank you.
John? First, let me personally and perhaps for all of us thank you for getting us started. Mm -hmm. there, there was a lot of behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff. There was a lot of stuff with bylaws and, and scope, et cetera, and, and you really helped steer us in the right direction. And thank you. Uh, I, also, I also have a general comment, it's, it, maybe it's personal observation, but uh, uh, when I got sucked into this committee, um, I was cautiously optimistic that we were going to end up in a pretty good place for the lagoon. What I'm seeing from this group, these conversations, the last meeting, the interplay with, with, with county, and not just uh, natural resources, but the money people and so on. What I'm seeing is something that looks to me like the end state of a quality system, which is a convergence of ideas and science and technology. And academia is here, and the county is here, and uh, government is here, and, uh, and private, private sector is here, uh, and on and on. I am really optimistic that we are going to save the lagoon because of all the convergence that's happening, because we're all sitting around this pot stove and talking about how to make it better. So uh, that's my comment. We're going to save the lagoon, and it's going to save us. <laughs> well said. I just have a quick comment. Um, we talked, thank you for your service, too. Um, we wouldn't be here without you that we are today, and we really appreciate you. I, I wanted to say that I really appreciate your conservative outlook on sunshine and things like that. I mean, it makes, it makes, um, it makes everything look very ethical and transparent, and I think that's very important for the public, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, I wanted to also say that we talked a lot about permitting, and I just wanted to make sure that you know, it didn't sound like, and I hope it didn't sound like we were really beating up the state agencies. I hope people understand that the reason why it takes three months is because they have no staff anymore. Yeah. And, and they're very, very underfunded. That's so, so um, you know, I think we, we need to be cognizant of that when we're talking about the, the permitting issues. It's not so much that they're unwilling or that they're being roadblocked on purpose. It's that they have um, no time to really look at new processes. And if it wasn't for people like you know, Annie, who I've, I've taken some of the classes that, you know, she takes time to give. If it wasn't for their, you know, probably working 24 hours a day doing this stuff, we wouldn't have those resources. So I just want to make sure that um, the public is aware that, you know, we're not beating them up. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're criticizing the, the process, not the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, with that, we will adjourn until July. All right. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor, and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period. Thank you.